Hello and welcome to the FOS interview. My name is Colin Salao. I'm a reporter with Front Office Sports. And today we are with the new head coach and the first head coach of the new WNBA uh, team, the Golden State Valkyries. She spent three years with the Las Vegas Aces and 10 years with the LA Clippers organization before being named the head coach of this expansion franchise. Welcome, Natalie Nakase. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And I wanted to start, you know, we're recording this on a Friday. Um, it's only been about 24 hours since you were announced as the new head coach. How has the last day or so been for you? <laughs> um, I think overwhelming is probably a good word, um, but, you know, that's part of it. Um, just like you said, I just came off um, a playoff run with the Las Vegas Aces. And so just going in now and then they're just like, okay, press conference time. And I'm like, all right. And uh, again, everyone finding out, I mean, it was just uh, such an amazing experience. And we were, as a staff, we were so well prepared that um, I felt really comfortable though at the same time as I was being overwhelmed with doing everything. So it's been great. You know, you were talking about it in the press conference yesterday toward the end. You were telling the v Vegas Aces players like Asia and Sydney Colson um, mm -hmm. that you were leaving. Yeah. But I assume the rest of the coaching staff might have had an idea. How is that kind of happening? Um, no, I, you know, I kept it, you know, yeah, just just my style is just like you kind of have to keep things in house because you have to be focused to me where your feet are. You always have to be present. And so. Um, yeah, I was focused on going as far as we could. I thought we were going to bring home a three-peat. Um, but unfortunately, we just couldn't finish uh, out the series with New York Liberty. And so, but I did, when I did obviously tell our coaching coaches, I mean, me and Becky cried for a good 30 minutes. And, you know, um, to me, I will never forget that moment just because, like, you could see the joy, obviously, in her and the way she hugged me and embraced me. Um understanding like this has been a big dream of mine and she knew that obviously but also just having her support but then also she's just like like go kill it go kill it you know like understanding we're competitors but she wanted me to succeed in such a way that you can tell like we're going to be family for life like that was a support from that you're getting from your big sister basically so I really appreciate it but obviously a ton of tears at the same time well, we're obviously going to mark our calendars for the first Valkyries versus Aces game <laughs> next year. Um, but so GM Ohema Nianen mentioned yesterday that the process kind of started for a, for a coach search the moment she was named the general manager. It was about five months ago. Mm -hmm. I want to know from your end how that process looked like. Like, were you reached out to? Did you reach out? And like, what was the process all the way to, you know, Thursday, yesterday when you were named the head coach? Mm. God, it again. All I'm thinking about is that New York Liberty loss right now. But <laughs> just kidding. Uh, it, no, it was about the Olympic break time. That's when um, she reached out to me. Yeah. So she reached out to me saying, you know, we would like some interest in the interview process. She actually had to reach out to obviously the Las Vegas Aces first because that's just, uh, you know, that's just the standard of how you do things is you reach out for permission and then moving forward, went through the interview process. Um Obviously for me, like I've been through about 30 to 40 interview, <laughs> interviews uh, throughout the NBA. So I kind of knew, you know, what to look for. Um, and yeah, like I just remember, and I said this yesterday, like my conversation with Joe was one of the most inspiring, um, impactful conversations I've ever had. And he just sat there and just told me like how he, he became successful. And I'm like sitting there like, this guy's telling me the secret sauce, you know what I mean? Like who wouldn't want to be, you know, like Joe, who wouldn't want to make, you know, as much money as him. So I just was like, wow, like this is, I took it more as not really an interview, but more as like, I'm just fortunate to kind of be in this conversation with him. And, um, and then, yeah, he was like, okay, the goal is going to be five years. You got to bring home a championship. And I'm just like, Hell yeah, we're going to bring in a championship. I mean, just the way he knew how to win. I was like, I just got to take that recipe as well. You're providing me with all these resources that I can't fail. Then, you know, I was more excited than people are saying, like, is that is that pressure? No, I'm excited. So, yeah. And I want to I want to go into your, you know, expectations in a little bit here because yeah. five years, very, very lofty. But also it seems like you're ready for that. But I wanted to ask, you know, you said 
in yesterday in a press conference too, you said you've wanted to work with the Golden State organization since 2015. Right. Um, but you know, they always say even to us, like when you're going through an interview process, you're it, you're being interviewed, but you're also kind of interviewing the place. Mm -hmm. And it seems like you said that you, you know your interview with Joe Lacob was a big deal, but. Were there any other things in the process that you saw that kind of convinced you like this is the place for me? Um, I would say a staple of all the people that was in the hiring process, like, like I said, great human beings. And like, when I mean great human beings, it's just the way you have conversations, right? Like they ask really, I would say, intentional questions about who you are as a person more than like, what do you know about basketball? And, you know, what could you, you know, just take from the Las Vegas Aces? Like, no, it actually just, it ended up being more of a conversation. And to me, that meant like, oh no, it's more about who, who I am as a person. And I really felt that through every, everyone that I was able to talk to. And then um, another, another thing was just Ohema, you know, I've known her since I think 2019 and we've kind of just been acquaintances, you know, since like, I think we've had maybe one or two lunches over the process of how many years is that? Five years. But every time I was able to talk to her, like it was all about, you know, just are you, good? you know, we're good people. And like we just kind of attracted towards each other, too, just because like we both made each other feel really comfortable. And I was like, wow, I go, you know, she's someone like I would love to work with, you know, if I just ever had the opportunity. So, yeah, I mean, she was a big part of it. Um, You know, I. Well, obviously we're sitting here and you were one of the big you know announcements yesterday is that you're the first female Asian American head coach right. in the WNBA and we're trying to figure out what the other labels are I'm sure there's there's even more one of the first few who's you know female Asian American coaches to coach in in any major US sport um and there's there's obviously barriers for for women to coach in sports in general that you've broken um when you coach in the NBA um, and then there's the fact that you're also a minority. Can you explain like the hurdles that people don't see, uh, that you've had to kind of jump through to get to this position right now? Mm. You know, what's funny when people say like hurdles and barriers, like people say that they kind of think it as a negative, you know, but when I was young, um, and I, I heard it a little bit like, because I was, I was the only Asian American player that was playing club ball, ball or what people call AU or, you know, things like that. Because I would look around, and I'm like, oh. And then I would hear from, you know, the crowd, like, oh, there's that Asian girl. There's the Asian player. Because I was the only one. And I just remember that. And I'm just like, huh. I'm like, how should I take this? You know, I was like 15, 16 years old. I was really young. But I was just like, well, I, at least they know who I am. Like they, they know that because I, I was really good. So I was just like, well, they're recognizing me now. They don't know my name, but I'm like, but the fact that like that, you know, they recognize me. And so like growing up and kind of like, I didn't think it as a negative just because they're just like, okay, they'll, you know, they're like, they're pointing me out. Like it was a negative. I was just like, you know, good. They know who I am because I'm about to kick their ass. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm about to, you know, beat them the next time I play them. So for me, I just like, I don't ever really see hurdles or barriers as much as people like from the outside think that I just say like, okay, what job do I want? Oh, I want to be a head coach. Oh, I want to coach, you know, in the W or I want to coach in the NBA, wherever. Like I just go for the job itself. And then I will ask, obviously, as anyone would, you would ask people that have been in that position. And then you ask like, well, how do I get there? And so then you utilize, you know, those tidbits, but like you don't bring up the barrier like you don't bring up the hurdle because now all you're doing is you're distracting yourself from just going straight for the goal if that makes sense so yeah. you know i guess i can just say like i just run them over that <laughs> i run over the, the hurdles you know rather than like think about it yeah it seems and obviously now here you are so it seems like the strategy paid off um <laughs> I, i'll go back to the uh what you said about joe lake of telling you hey i want to win a championship in five years mm -hmm. um and I'm looking at expansion franchises in the W and, and, and other leagues in the W specifically, you know, some of the recent ones, the sky, it, it, it took them seven years to make the playoffs um, in two, from 2006 and 16 years to win the title. But the dream on the other hand, while they've never won a title yet, they made three of the first six years, they made the finals. 
Um, I'm curious if you've looked through whether it's the W teams or other expansion franchises in other leagues um, and seen what kind of worked for them to get you know the ball rolling very quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've definitely done some research um, on teams that have started as an expansion team. But then, they, like, if I can think right away, I mean, Atlanta doesn't have their own practice facility. Chicago is saying that they're having their practice facility come soon. Like, again, Joe... Joe is providing us with a practice facility. And I'm trying to tell people who don't have a practice facility, it's a huge advantage. And so whether owners, however they want to see it, like it's a huge advantage. There's a place where our players can go 24-7. There's a place where the coaching staff can go 24-7. So if we want to meet, we don't have to go to just a random office space. Like we're right there. And also we're connected under one umbrella, right? So if we have to go pull in a player and just be like, hey, we have something to say or we got something to talk about right away everything's under the same, you know, building. And so that's what I'm saying is like, I'm put in a different position. We have a great arena. We have a fan base. We have, you know, um, our own locker room in the Chase Center. Like we have so many things that are already, I would say, upgraded from, I think, other teams. That's just my opinion. Yeah. yeah um, and I that's actually perfect because I was going to ask you next about the practice facility <laughs> Um, you mentioned, you know, that you've mentioned in press conferences again now how important it is. Um, and, you know, from what I've seen in the league, it, it seems like it, you could tell the difference, like you said, between the teams that have like a lot of investment versus mm -hmm. the teams that perhaps may have not received that investment yet or are trying to build their facilities, um, not just with the facility, but any investment in general. I'm curious, like you've talked to the players. How much would you say those players are talking about that as well in terms of the investment, in terms of making their decision of where to play. It's it's huge. And you can see the wave of change of where the players move last year, right? So how many players move to Phoenix because they have their own practice facility? How many star players move to Seattle because their practice facility? Like, it's a huge thing, you know? Again, because these athletes, they deserve their own practice facility. I think it's more like it's crazy to, to say that not every team has their own practice facility. These are professional athletes that work really, really hard. So they need a place to be able to work, but also recover, you know, and also have space just to bond. I mean, like every team needs to have one. But to your point, it's, it's a big conversation for these players because they know that they can actually be at their best when they have access to a facility 24-7. You know, like it's a personal goal. I'm sure it's a personal goal for them to be like, no, well, I want to be a great player for that organization. And how can I, you know, get there? Or how can I be a part of a, a place that has its own practice facility? So it's huge <laughs> to answer your question. <laughs> so it, it's nice to know that. It, it's interesting to hear it from someone who's like really in the weeds because you could see it from the outside from like kind of evidence, but to see it like really play out, right? And, and hear someone who's talking to the players. Um, I, you know, the, the expansion draft for the Valkyries is scheduled for December 6th, mm -hmm. right? That's in less than two months. Mm -hmm. Um, what's the, what, what does the work look like from now till then for you guys? Um, a lot of meetings, you know, um, me, Ohem and Banya, again, we've, we created our own list, um, for expansion draft. And now it's like putting our list together, being on the same page. And so, yeah, like even after the press conference, we had a meeting, um, we're gonna have a meeting today. And so it's just like continuous meetings about collaborating what we feel like are going to be the 12 best 12 players. And then from there, it's about kind of doing our, our background checks, right? Like you wouldn't bring in a guest if you didn't know, like who you would want as a guest, right? So you would do a background check to make sure this person's qualified. So it's the same thing as when you get players is like, you know, you want to know how they were raised, what kind of environment did they, you know, grow up in or what were they like as a college player? Maybe you, you know, you start to do a deep dive with the college coaches um, and, you know, just make sure you do your research just because again, we're trying to go for a championship here. So we want to know everything and anything that we can about the players that we're going to bring in. Um, I, I wanted to shift gears to the kind of the growth of the WNBA over the last you know year and and honestly like five years, um, but there's been a lot of talk about this growth. A lot of it is focused on the players' perspective. Obviously, everyone knows Caitlin Clark, Angel Reese, but even like how Asia has been you know put into the spotlight as of late has been you know different from past years. Mm -hmm. I'm curious how 
the coaches have felt about it or what's the perspective you guys have seen um, over this kind of last few years of growth? Yeah. Well, being in it just two years, you know, this is my third going on my fourth year. So I'm kind of a little bit of a newbie, but um, you know, it's, it's been amazing. Like anytime, you know, a player like Caitlin and, and Angel Reese and, you know, don't forget Cameron Brink and um, Rakia Jackson. I mean, I can go down the line of some of these players that have done really, really well their first year. And then obviously Asia Wilson, like just being, I don't know, everywhere, Gatorade commercial, like she's everywhere. Um, like that's only a positive, you know, like, and plus you want to welcome in really, really great players because what matters is the product, right? What matters is what the basketball is on the floor. And so the more we can bring really high talented players that are creating obviously a great buzz, I mean, that's huge for the W, you know, and we're moving definitely in the right direction because of them. Um, I wanted to ask one thing that, that kind of piqued my interest um, about coaching as well, because with you and Becky and even the likes of like Teresa Weatherspoon, you kind of alluded to it. You moved from coaching in the NBA for a decade to mm -hmm. and breaking those barriers, whether you want to be believe you, you broke some or not, you know, mm -hmm. you broke those barriers by being, you know, some of the first female coaches in the, in the NBA. And then yeah. you've moved to the WNBA mm -hmm. um, and established like more female coaches in the W I'm, I'm kind of curious your perspective on like establishing female head coaches in the WNBA mm -hmm. versus perhaps breaking those barriers in the men's league. Um, like what have you had that conversation of, Oh, should I stay here? And, perhaps, you know, be the first female head coach in the NBA or let's establish what we have in the W. Is that a conversation you have? No, not really. I mean, because everyone has their own life and their own family and to be honest, their own crap to deal with, you know what I mean? Without, sorry, without saying anything, but everyone's life is different. You know, like I literally, um, one of my main shifts that people don't talk about, but maybe I, I touched a little bit about it yesterday was the year I moved to work for Becky Hammond was the year my dad passed. And I just, I was just in a really, really dark place. And again, when she asked me the question, when the first time we jumped on the phone was, how are you doing as a person? And I was able to share how I really felt at the time. And because normally it's just like X's and O's, you know, what, like I said in an interview, like you break down how can you win a championship? But no, Becky was like, how are you doing? So I needed that. I needed that change. I needed that tra transition um, to work under such a genuine leader that I knew I could learn a ton from just her X's and O's, um, but more as a person and more as how she was going to lead, you know, our team. So the journey from WNBA to NBA, like that for me, it's all, all great. You know, because I've always learned under great coaches. Vinny Del Negro hired me, Doc Rivers, Tyron Lue. Like, I've been blessed, you know. But I think I also do, I'm attracted to really great coaches. You know, like, I, I just am because I'm a, I'm a very curious person. I love to ask questions. And so, for me, my path was based off of, like, what was happening in my life. And then, for me, that I'm attracted to really, really, like, high-level coaches. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, one final one. You know, you kind of got teared up yesterday when you talked about your family, yeah. uh, what they've meant to you. You, you talked about your father. Um, mm -hmm. Can you kind of go deeper into, you know, what they've meant for you so far and, and getting to this point and what they'll be for the rest of or for the start of this journey? Yeah. Um, yeah. Losing, you know, losing my dad, like, again, he was my best friend. He was my rock. I mean, it's crazy. Like even yesterday before the press conference, I was like, I want to call dad. <laughs> like, I just want to call him. Um, like, I just want to like hear his voice and, you know, I'm hoping like he'd be proud of me. I think he would, you know, and when he's proud of me, he always kind of gives me this like head nod, like head nod of approval. I don't know. Um, that was just our thing. But, um, but yeah, so what I, well, what I do just personally, um, I just, I do talk to him. I'll just go into a room and I'll just like pretend that he's listening from up above and I'll, I'll, I'll have a conversation. Um, so it's just been so helpful, um, for my family and, and my best friend, Melissa, that like, they pick up the phone every time I call, like every time. Cause I talk to my dad every single day. And so, um, like, even if they miss it, they'll like call back within like five minutes. And, uh, that's just been big because, 
for anyone who's lost a best friend or a relative or, or a parent, like, um, you know, it's, it's about the people that can be there for you, you know, and it's not just also being there. It's just always being there. Like they always pick up that call. It's just because like, I can get into like really tough times um, just because I put a lot of, you know, uh, challenges that people like to say pressure. Like I like to put myself in real stressful situations. And so they always kind of pull me out and say like, take a breath. It's okay. You know, um, everything happens for a reason. And so, yeah, they're, they're huge. I mean, I would, I wouldn't even be, it's kind of crazy, but I wouldn't even be alive if they were here. They weren't there answering those calls, like as much as, you know, that sounds pretty deep, but yeah, no, they're, they're a huge part of my success and moving forward. You know, I can't wait for them to experience this journey. Yeah. Uh, thank you for sharing that with us on the FOS interview. And yeah. we look forward to watching you in your journey um, with a, with the 13th team in the WNBA next year's expansion team, the Golden State Valkyrie. So thank you so much for joining us. Natalie Nakase, the, the next head coach of the expansion Golden State Valkyries. Thank you for having me.